Hello and welcome everyone to our PICTAS webinar. Uh, my name's Nikki, I'm your host today and I'm really excited to introduce to you again our amazing guest speakers, Geron and Michelle Roth. Welcome back both. Hi everybody. It's great to have you here today. Uh, I'm sure everyone's looking forward to this webinar. I know I am. You guys are absolutely amazing. Um, if you don't know Garen and Michelle, they create incredible conceptual fine art portraiture. And for this webinar, they will be talking about shutter drag for creative portraits and still life. So uh, throughout the webinar, um, you'll get an understanding of shutter drag. And I think you're also going to do some uh, case demonstrations, aren't you, for a still life and a portrait? Yes. Yeah. So um, I've said this before, these guys are totally awe-inspiring and they're creative geniuses, so it's going to be well worth watching. So uh, just a little bit of housekeeping, we're going to use the chat box for any questions and Michelle and Garen normally talk to everyone as they're going along, so if there's any questions, they'll answer them there. So okay, so I'm going to pass you over to Garen and Michelle and uh, enjoy the webinar everyone, thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Thanks, Nikki. All right. Let me just get all my screen sharing things in order. Okay. So thank you, Peters, for giving us this opportunity to present another webinar for you guys. We are Sculpt Art. Um, my name is Garen and my wife, Michelle, and we create stuff together. Everything we do, we basically um, pick each other's brains and we, we try and see what we can come up with. So we create, a, um, we, we, the, for this webinar, we're doing shutter drag for creative portraiture and some interesting product or still life shots. Uh, we've got so five sections to sort of get through today. Section one is understanding shutter drag. Section two, case study, descent into chaos. It's an old shoot that we, that we did. And then section three will be another shoot that we did in 2022, Pride Blur. And then we're going to look at um, specifically applications that we did for the webinar just to sort of get through all the little technical stuff and, and show exactly how we um how we get what we what we need to do let me just see if i can move that perfect all right so there is quite a lot to cover um so i'm going to rush through a little bit of the stuff but the the end will be well worth it what is shutter drag um basically shutter drag is simply long exposure photography it's nothing else than that if you look, think of long exposure photography, the traditional stuff like astrophotography or using a, a long exposure to blur waves or waterfalls and then anything in low light. Um, and then within that sphere of things, you get stuff like light painting, motion blur, and then stroboscopic flash. And what we like to do, and when I speak about Shutter Drag in this webinar, it's a lot to do with what, what we get up to. Um, I'm not coining the phrase of my own, I'm just so, so that you guys understand what, what we mean. We combine stroboscopic light painting and motion blur in a lot of our shots, so just to make it a bit more dynamic and a bit more interesting. Um, just a couple of names to mention for light painting, I suggest looking at Eric, Eric Poiré's work or Atten Conrad, uh, motion blur, Lindsay Adler, and Sale Strong, my favorite. And then for stroboscopic flash, Carl Taylor and Howard Schutz has done some amazing work, which is worth looking at. Right, so how we use Shaka Direct, we combine motion blur and light painting with manual flashes. Uh, we haven't had a stroboscopic flash until just recently, last week. So very happy and excited to try that out in the future. Some requirements that you'll need for shutter drag, you'll need a, const a dimmable constant light source. So something that you can increase or decrease the power on a dark scene for your subject to move inside, and then you need to be able to control sh shutter, and aperture, and ISO on your camera, so preferably manual mode, and then allow yourself enough time because there's no way of guaranteeing anything in this. Um, you can make a lot of mistakes. We shoot hundreds of photos to finally get what we want. The best ones are usually accidental. Yeah, <laughs> so just uh, to understand the, the physics of shutter drag. So the shutter needs to be open to allow light to fall onto the sensor. Because you're in a dark scene, the subject can then move around and whatever is being reflected off that subject will be laid down on the sensor, but it will create a blurred effect. The same with light painting, because of the intensity of the light, you will leave a streak of light behind wherever that moves. Best subjects to photograph, um, is something that's shiny or highly reflective. 
And also, like I saw in the product shots, um, if you've got a flat surface area that's facing camera, that's going to work better as well. As soon as there's a curvature, it starts getting a bit tricky. So if we just quickly explain this at the bottom left, you can see the curtain is enclosed in front of the sensor. So when B, when you press the shutter, B curtain starts running to the right. When it's open, it, it allows light to fall onto the sensor, and then A curtain will move right as well to close the sensor. When we're looking at what's happening during exposure, so if the star is your um, subject and it's moving from left to right on the screen, as soon as the curtain is all the way open, that is being recorded, that whole movement is being recorded onto the sensor. So that, because it's not an instant in time, it's now a longer period, you're going to see a blurred motion. So if we had to create a scenario, this was completely fictional, we had a one second exposure time and our light intensity was at 50% of the light capacity and the star moved at one meter per second over a complete distance of one and a half meters you'll see that as the star starts to move, before it reaches speed, there's more exposure happening because they're in one place. And then anyway, when they move, they blur on the thing, but because they're moving in this instance at one point, one meter a second, they don't cover the entire distance and come to a standstill. And that's why you see the blur not ending with a star on the other side. By changing some dynamics, making it a two second exposure time and giving the star a bit more speed and a bit more light intensity, now you can have the star being recorded. It starts to move, it speeds up. Okay, so you're going to blur in this middle section and then it freezes as it slows down to stop at the end of the frame again. Oversimplification, but hopefully you get the idea. Another thing we have to understand is front and rear curtain sync with a flash. So when you start putting a flash into your long exposure, front curtain sync, basically as B curtain leaves A curtain, when it reaches and the sensor is completely open, front curtain flashes then. Okay. Rear curtain would flash the instant just before A curtain would then try and catch up with B curtain. So the idea is your sensor is here, B curtain opens up, sensor gets light, A curtain closes. And that's the idea. So how we use front curtain and rear curtain sync, if you have front curtain sync, the streak line will be after your subject or be, sorry, your, your subject will be frozen first and then the streak line will appear. Rear curtain, streak line will be appearing first and then your subject will be frozen. So this rear curtain makes a lot more sense for us because we're reading from left to right in, in Western culture. So rear curtain gives you that illusion of speed, you know, blur behind and then the, the capture of the moment. <laughs> if you trigger manually, you can determine when you want your, your frozen part of your subject to happen. In the, so you'll have blur, you can freeze them in the middle and then carry on. Stroboscopic flash is just that. You have three or however many flashes you want to, but every time you flash, you're essentially freezing the subject. Later on in the product shots, I'll show you guys what's very important to understand here is the difference in exposure between your drag lines and your actual subject. Uh, okay. For this demonstration, we're going to be using EV200 from Godox. This is our constant light. It, is, it also serves as a flash. It does have uh, sync capabilities, but we're using it as a, as a constant light in this one. And then the little AD300s, our, uh, our steadfast little lights, they're going to do the rest. And then in the product stuff that I shot uh, earlier this week, we we used the QT600, but not to its full capacity yet. You just started playing with yeah, it. I don't yeah, even, I don't even know what to do with that light yet. I'm so excited. All right, so Descent into Chaos. Um, Michelle made this figure um, for us in 20, 20, what? 21, yeah. Um, and so we wanted to, to recreate this, but we wanted to be a bit more dynamic. Michelle was part of a, a, a fine art exhibit in uh, down the Western Cape. And so we wanted to add a little bit more dynamic elements into the photograph. And so we said, let's, let's include shutter drag or let's motion blur into this photograph. So these are the raw files. And as you can see here, this is an example. She's moving from right to left. So this is an example of rear curtain sync. Okay. She... She, she moves, she creates the drag line, and when she gets to the other side of the frame, the flash goes off and her drag trail is behind her. Here is front curtain sync, and then a manual flash at the end. So we've 
We, as the shutter was depressed, she's frozen. We have a drag line happening. And then just before the exposure ends, I press the shutter again. Oh, the, not the shutter, sorry, the, the flash again. And we freeze her at the end. Then we um, wanted to create this sort of state of mind. So going from the real world, she, she's a, it was a shamanic workshop. So she goes from the real world into the spirit world. So we started playing with how we can get three figures. At the moment in this shot, we're using two flashes and the middle one, she just pauses. So in the time, you can see her drag lines on her face. She pauses in the middle and then starts the movement again. It's a bit tricky to get your exposure right with these things, but you get really great effects when you start doing this kind of thing. So I'll play you guys a video. Run through the final shots of Descent into Chaos and how we got to the, the final shot um, that we it, it selected for our exhibition in the end. Um, so obviously here from coming from this, the still frames uh, that we were doing before, you know, with the changing the exposure to two seconds, we started there. We, you know, over, completely overexposed, but we knew we wanted her to sit down for this one to restrict the movement only to her upper body. Once we got the camera sort of in the position, we, we knew we wanted a transition from one state of mind, so from the real world into the spirit world. So we wanted, uh, you know, three faces. So real world, uh, in the middle transitional phase, you know, where, where the chaos begins and then eventually into the spirit world. Um, so we worked with this movement of hers. We're figuring out how the hands can hold the horns and what can work. And I, I really love this shot, actually. We've got some lovely drag trails happening here. Interesting things happening with her body because of how the light is catching at the beginning and the end. So I, I, I still will develop this shot eventually. Let me just mark that up. Um, okay, so here we, we're starting to get a result. Uh, and here we have 8300 firing from this side. Um, we've got another one firing from, from this side. You can see those beads there are frozen. And then the FV200 um, from the top. So that's our constant light. It's falling from the top here. And that's why we have the blur all the way through. We've frozen at the front curtain sink in the beginning of the, of the exposure. And I'm manually flashing at the end of the exposure as well. Um, most likely what happened is I got it just as the shutter was busy closing, so we don't have a full exposure, or we, we didn't get the light to its maximum um, capacity on this where it's so underexposed. And moving on from that, you know, we just start playing, we start increasing the output on this light, and you'll see now we're gonna, we're gonna actually move away from two seconds, it's just too short of an exposure. And um, we're gonna increase it. So, Always add more time for your exposure than, than just trying to do it as quickly as you can. Make the room darker, get rid of all the ambient light, and control the light and increase your shutter speed. It, it works out much better now that I've done a couple of these. I can guarantee that. Um, so after that, love the hand movement here, but eventually we decided we wanted a, a sort of a triangular shape or a, or a shape like this. So you'll see Michelle's hand is going to move down onto the seat there and you know she's going to really just work on getting this motion correct. Better exposure this time on the two flashes beginning and end but we don't have this middle transitional thing yet. Um, so they, they were actually taken in color and now we're starting to get where we want to go. Um, as you can see here I really wanted this eye to be sharp and prominent. So what Michelle is doing at the moment is she is reflashing, she moves, she pauses, and then she moves to the end of the frame. You can see we've increased it to four seconds. And we so we have 8300, number one, flashing there, nothing here, and number two flashing over there. So front curtain sink, rear curtain sink. And this is just a manual pause and relying on this EV200 to freeze this part for us. What that does though, is because this EV200 is rather hard from, from a standard reflector, we are getting overexposed on this white piece of the skull. Now this was my mistake because she's wearing so much black, you know, I wanted to get the, the, the specularity of the beads and all of these things. And using a standard reflector, I thought I was doing the right thing, but in hindsight, 
because there's white up in the mar in the in the um, headdress up here and the white skull and her white makeup on her face I shouldn't have done that I should have diffused this light and added another light that I would have had to make um, at the bottom to get better exposure there so this was our first shot where we realized okay this is what we want and this one is actually my second favorite from from the series I love the way that that our um, spirit state here is you know how it transitioned into that sort of ghosting effect she's really nicely frozen and what I what I've done by this stage and I'm firing a manual TT350 in the middle here so um, front curtain sink for for this part manual exposure for this part and the the rear exposure with the other 8300 although for this particular shot it's underexposed I don't think it actually fired the battery might have been going <coughs> and so we carry on and that's the thing about this kind of photography you have to just give yourself a lot of time um, and redo it and redo it and redo it until you finally get it okay so sorry I made a mistake so from these ones there's no flash firing yet there's a flash firing so I move the flash next to camera there's a flash firing there and there and there's nothing firing yet then by the stage we've got you can see there that's just relying on on the actual exposure coming from the EV200 that is frozen and that is frozen um, so then I move the 8300 back across to the side to, to freeze her at the end and this is where we got the TT 350 little light to to expose her in the middle and that's still at 8300 over there oops you guys know what I mean um, okay so we're getting closer we're starting to make the micro adjustments sort of starting to look up in the beginning of the exposure this one needs to be looking at camera and there we are going into the spirit realm so this one was my second favorite choice um, and finally we ended up with that's our final shot so Michelle's looking into camera um, starting eyeline up there which was really nice then for the middle there the eyeline is just over camera which which worked out quite nicely and then this last one where we can't see our eye is actually just perfect so here she's she's completely transitioned she's a she's this ghost-like creature and we you know we contrast that with this um, still figure in the beginning and then again the transitional lines that we have going across there. let me just take all the red off so when we got to this we realized we were happy what her arm is doing down here is really nice so you have this you know you've got these lines keeping your eye on the right hand side of the photograph and then there's this sort of emptiness on this side so we went from that to the final shot which i'll show you just now okay so that's what we ended up with obviously we can't make a fire in the studio so um, <laughs> if you look at our photographer we add quite a lot of stuff in post um, you know, and, and you know, whatever works for the final photograph, the, the messages in the final photograph, I do cheat a lot. Um, I add stuff when I can. I'll show you in the product photography as well. You know, sometimes you just can't get exactly what you want. I didn't have uh, endless amounts of time or a brief really to work again. So it was just trying to demo the, the idea. But um, the end photograph is what gives out the message. So we added the fire, we added some smoke in the background, but this is still one of my favorite pictures. We actually got it printed nice and big, um, and uh, it's a really, really nice piece of work. Okay, so next up, case study, Pride Blur. Is everybody still with me? The, the, the How we got this previous shot makes sense. Shutter's open. When she moves through the constant light, she's reflecting light, and that just basically puts information down on the sensor and the flashes are freezing her wherever the flashes are going off. So Prime Blur was an exhibition that we did in 2022, and we wanted to, to represent the um, LGBTQ plus community in the hometown that we live in. And so Michelle came up with a, 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 a 
uh, not a creature, but a being for each. We were, we were taking Dan, Daniel Quassar's progress pride flag and interpreting that through people. Yeah, we basically just sort of gave uh, each color um, and, and what it represents um, a little bit more emotion and turned it into a being that you could see that represented life, healing, sunlight, nature, ser uh, serenity, spirit, people of color, and trans community. It was a really great project. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. It was eye opening uh, as well. Very ambitious. Um, we jumped into this not understanding what we were getting ourselves into. I think actually when we agreed to do it to the exhibition date, we only had five weeks to do it in, and that was planning, finding models, doing everything. Um, so some of the challenges that we had was finding models that were willing to get involved. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty conservative on this side of the world. Yeah, we've got a very conservative community. So. <laughs> uh, it was our first time doing Shutter Drag on this scale. I mean, I played a little bit with it before, but nothing really. And, and I think this project has made it my favorite kind of, you know, uh, medium to work in. Um, our biggest issue is our ceiling height in our studio. I can't get a light high enough above a model. So when I put the lights above the model, I have to make them smaller. Um, and then getting makeup supplies on time, that was a big one. Because yeah. you were full body painting pretty much all our models. Yeah, it's a very big challenge in, in South Africa. Um, I don't think some of the suppliers, I'm not, Craylin is fantastic. They they get it to you next day. But other suppliers are not really with the um, I need it tomorrow vibe. And yeah. So I was putting my hair out, but we got it done. <laughs> and also the first time we worked with an airbrush and we made an yeah. airbrush system ourselves. We didn't buy one. So um, that was a big challenge. But uh, let's let's go through it. So Michelle made everything herself. Um, I am very blessed to have such capable hands and, and, and a cre creative mind in, in the studio. So everything was made. There you can see the planning on the left-hand side for each uh, being that we were going to create. Um, they did change some of them. You yeah. know, the initial planning and what we ended up with is not, not the same. There's a hairdress on the right-hand side for one of the shots for spirit. And I think it's very important to be very flexible when you're creating something. And if you see it's not turning out the way you want it, instead of giving up, just keep going. You know, trust the process. And what you end up with is is more than likely what's coming from your from your, your creative spirit. So just go with it. You know, don't be scared of what comes out in the end. So I'm just going to play you a little video that we actually made before. Um, just it, it's just nice and compact and shows you at least one of the characters, um, sort of the, the lighting, the makeup and, and how we got the shot. Just so everybody doesn't think I'm a crazy person throwing, just sort of standing with a piece of fabric in my studio. <laughs> um, so with us shooting this motion blur, so you can see the Rory's arms are going to be moving, sort of just changing positions. Um, we would needed something in the background. Otherwise, it would just be a lot of sort of colorful people on a black backdrop. So we, we combined it with, with fabric. Um, and it, it, uh, the message behind that was we all cut from the same cloth. 
um, regardless of how you how you identify or feel or anything like that. Um, and so we composited that in afterwards. <laughs> um, so there is a lighting setup. You can see the constant light above and then the two flashes on either side. Um, so we initially tried to have her looking one way and then the other, but then we eventually changed that and sort of just kept the movement a bit smaller, which was a bit more effective. Um, if you follow my social media, you'll recognize the shot on the right. This is the raw out of camera shot. So flashed on the right hand side, fired first. She moves her face, flash on the left, goes off second. And then I just love the fabric, mm. um, you know, especially the blue one. It just looked like water. Uh, so you just chuck it under a long exposure and have the flash go off. Um, and it really, the different uh, colors of fabric and, and the textures give you amazing effects. So I, we must actually do a project with that again. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the final shot for Serenity for blue. Um, you can see the fabric being added in the background and you can see her, her four arms coming out of her. And the idea behind her was to sort of be in water, be floating, um, give those the serene awesome. feeling. Check yeah. Right. Then I'm just going to run through, I think, three uh, or four of these. Um, for yellow sunlight, we wanted something big because, you know, the sun is, is a massive force and we wanted energy. So we, we were lucky enough to get Gerard in. He's an incredible dancer and, and he came in. Um, this is a shot straight out of camera. I'll show you where the light's coming from in a second. Just to make a note, when you're doing this sort of thing and you want to, especially with stroboscopic uh, kind of photography, the light makes a difference. And this is the reason we got the QT600 now. The 8300s, which we used here, their T number is not fast enough. They can't give us a flash of, of light for a short enough burst um, to freeze motion that is very fast moving. So Harat is really moving his body in this shot. And you can see he is slightly blurry. Um, whereas the, the QT600, it's a ridiculous number. I think it's like one thirtieth thousandth of a second. So anything that's very fast moving, you can you can freeze with that. So I'm excited to do some dances. Just to show you how we got the shot. Um, we did this move probably about 150 times. We used the entire studio floor, a lot of elements. This made us realize we need a higher ceiling. <laughs> yeah. Because Harold nearly bumped his head every time. So the cloth had to fall in the right place. The flash had to go off at the right moment. And um, that was that particular shot. So you can see all that movement behind him as he's coming across. We were lucky to get the cloth to fall there. Um, again, shooting the cloth on its own, just to use it in the background. And that was the shot that we ended up using. These are looking a little bit overexposed to you guys because these are all my print files. So they are one and a half stops over. Um, there's another variant that we did. So you can see the, the, the great effect that you can get with this you know, shutter drag with this motion photography. So you've got all these blur lines behind him um, coming up there, you know, and then we added some cloth here in post. So that's, it's a lot of fun working with this sort of photography. This one was very interesting, um, people of color. Um, that's that answer. Yeah. However, we were supposed to have two models for this and we could only get one. So yeah. Oki, who's also an amazing dancer, came through for us and he said, he'll do both parts because we explained to him how the shots are going to work. He's going to move through two things. But Michelle had an incredible idea, and she said he's, she's going to divide him in half, and she's going to paint the one half brown and the other half this, this sort of silver it's charcoal like color. Black, yeah. And it worked like a dream. He could be two people. So if you see there on the left-hand side, the side is brown, and that's that sort of silver metallic color. Especially that shot. Yeah. And then here you can see how if he faces one way to camera, um, and he moves, there he pauses under the constant light. So that's not a flash. That is just him pausing at exactly the right moment. And then he turns the other way. So we have two people in one photograph. Mm, I this was our original um, out of camera shot, which we printed eventually. And the idea was to show struggle, to show a pride of a proud people. Um, and we combined it with the cloth later on. And that was our, our final exhibition piece. Yeah. Um, I really loved this one as well. Yeah. We sort of go from the struggle pose and then I added the cape with the cloth that I had um, and sort of to this heroic being on the right-hand side. And then that one I just had to play a little bit with, a little bit harsh, 
um, but I like the effect anyway. Mm. So then finally, just to come over to the stroboscopic side of things, we have multiple flashes in an exposure. Um, this was just a bonus that we did. It was called PLUS, so the PLUS in LGBTQ+. Plus. And it was just to create, you know, a, 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 fear, a fearsome force and a, and a kind force and also a, a godlike creature. Which is extra. It's extra. Yeah. <laughs> um, so three flashes are happening here over a six-second exposure. Um, and because, so obviously, the, the, so just look at the color difference. With Oki's color, the, the, the black that, or the charcoal that Michelle used on him was a very slight different shade to what she used on me here and you can see that 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 the even a small difference shows up very differently in in this kind of photography so the shinier an object the better you can see the cross um shine up very nicely and then this is actually a 12 second exposure so it's just moving the hands and flashing at each point um, and then just coloring in the blur line with in, in Photoshop. Yeah. So if you're employing a, a makeup artist to assist you, I would I would suggest that in the look um, that you incorporate some as much bling as possible. And girls going yes, but yeah, as much bling as possible. Lots of cut and shine. Um, yeah, I think even highlight would work quite well. So shiny, shiny. All right, so <clears throat> last one. This one's going to have a couple of videos because it is just too much for my head to. I'm going to I'm going to talk nonsense if I had to try and explain everything here. So I made videos on the day, which I think is a little bit more engaging than just hearing my voice. So for our first example in the product photography, we're going to be moving the camera and the can in relation with the lights in the background. So here we have everything stationary. You can see the LED behind the light, and we've got a fill coming in from the right hand side on our can and everything is on a turntable. Um, so the camera and the can move in relation with each other and then they blur the background. Think about like a Formula One shot where the camera is panning with the car and then you get a blurry background. Um, so what this does is it also changes the relationship of the light to the subject. Now that can cause a little bit of muddiness. Here on the left you can see the can is nice and clear. Um, the right side is getting a little bit red there and there we can see how that muddiness affects the can um, so better way to do it is by keeping your subject stationary and moving the light so painting with the light behind it um, our key light the white light also remains stationary in this example and then it gives us the perfect fill that we want so that is the difference it is a much clearer and better image it's always a good thing to remember when you light painting um, the, how the light moves around your subject, especially red light with digital photography, um, it is going to it's going to have a different characteristic to it being a stationary light. So always remember that uh, white light is obviously a lot more forgiving, but your red light is is, is not not so forgiving. Yeah. So we played with the with the red light, and we're going to again swoop this across the frame now, um, just to show now again with the layering. So. What we've done, we've added this ring light over here, keeping the color tempo quite cool, with the lovely warm tint from the red. As you can see on the screen, we created just a photograph with everything being red in the background, simply by moving this light during a high exposure. If you don't have an LED panel, for instance, or something like that. Um, and we've got our full light filling in over the side. So the camera's going to remain stationary, subject's going to remain stationary. We're going to add this ring light in the background now and then we're going to move this to create that red again but you're going to see in the layering because of the intensity of this light the it, it will come through the red so we're going to create a ring around our um, can the white light gives us a lovely rim on the edges of the can and then this is going to create our red background so we're layering the lighting effects all right so just to show you when it's stationary That's the soil effect we're getting, lovely reflections on the mirror. We've got the, the red beam going through, and we've got our ring lights in the back. We've got a beautiful rim on the sides there. So now let's, let's move this guy through the, through the scene. So 
we still retain that lovely rim lighting. So if this was a constant light source, if the red was a constant panel that we, that we put behind, it would interfere with that white light that we're having. Okay, so that white room. So this is a nice way to achieve uh, this sort of effect. I would like very much just a tad more fill on this side of white light. There we need a little bit of white. So I'm just going to pop in our 8300 quickly, just from this side with a bit of foil, just to give us a little bit more light on where it's written over there. Perfect. All right, so all our little full lights and everything is where it should be. Let's go for final light painting in the background, the light exposure. Very nice. I do prefer coming from the bottom upwards because the you know coming down I'm slowing down because I want to stop the light. So I, I tend to to leave the, the the red exposing on the bottom side of the can a bit too long. So I'm going to rather go from this side. I think it's going to be better. So that covers light painting. Now I want to just demonstrate how important it is to think about um, when you when you add so so motion blur is one thing. So you have a constant light, you put your subject moving, and you can add your flashes. That that's fine. That's that's the the, the good easy stuff. As soon as you start adding light painting into the, the the mix, you start getting a whole different dynamic, and you've got to start thinking about how you are layering things onto the sensor. Because a light that is shining towards the sensor is always going to overshadow what you've laid down there already. Not always, but 90% of the time. So you've got to think about timing, how you cross things in your frame, how you add stuff down on the sensor. Um, so here I'm going to just show you what happens if you if you move, uh, if you don't time your, your light painting correctly. So I just want to highlight a mistake that I was making on the day. Notice I'm moving the can and the light at the same time. So I'm not giving the subject enough time to mask itself onto the sensor. And then you get this light being painted through the can or through the subject. So that's what that looks like. Um, the edges are clean at the beginning, but everything becomes muddy at the end. So just to show you a contrasting image here, the can is lying stationary and we're painting behind. And you're going to have a red um paint in the mirror and in the background so it's just a little bit of a cheat to cover a big area but the can is not moving at all now i'm going to move the light first leave the can stationary so the can has time to mask itself onto the sensor the light stops moving and then the can is moved and that gives us a stationary uh, well exposed can and then we have a little bit of blur so the can was a little bit fast in this movement. That's why only the bull um, is blurred. But that's the idea behind moving the subject. Notice no flash is being used, still constant light sources. Okay, so that just, uh, it's just to indicate because you're going to see now in the next um, bunch of, of shots that I'm going to go through where I don't get my timing right and you're going to lose your, your uh, motion blur effect or you won't get a sharp image like you want. So our last product setup, um, this is our lighting setup for the shot. We've got an AD300 up there, the EV200 constant light source up there. And then in the softbox, we've got the new QT600 that is going to put the key light on our subject. AD300 is the backlight. Um, here you can see me fiddling and trying to get the can stuck on the acrylic tubing without success. For the final shots of the shutter drag with the product, I'm just going to run through sort of the raw files here so you guys can see um, how things develop and the mistakes are made and how to fix them. 
So the first mistake here is you can see there four seconds. My my movement speed of my can is not long. Oh, it's too long. So there isn't enough exposure ship separation between the drag line and the actual can. So that's when the flash went off um, at that point. And then here's just the drag line of the can. Uh, similar here, again, the, the flash went off, um, but it doesn't even look like I'm in the right focal plane here. So I'm doing this freehand and the, the camera is set to manual focus um, with F16. So I just have to operate within a plane, but this just looks soft to me over there. Um, and here we can see it again. So there the can is now sharp, but I'm, my speed is not is not correct. So I'm taking too long to move the can. And you can also see what happened here. The can is crossing its own path in this instance. So therefore the can is now hidden behind its drag lines. Um, here's a similar problem. And uh, just to go back here, what's interesting here is you can see the angle of the can also makes a difference or your view subject. So there is a darker area. The, the reflection is not so great off the, off the part, part of the can there. And then here, obviously, the, the can is angled in a different manner to give maximum reflection. So you get lovely contrast in the drag lines. When I do this sort of photography, I always get just a bunch of variations of things. Um, you never know where you can use this later on. And while you're shooting, then just get it. Um, okay, now we, we're getting the can a bit more correct. Um, this is almost a usable shot. I like what the can is doing here. The speed, you can see much faster in my movement. So I'm jer jerking it back and forth. And the um, drag line is almost invisible there. And you just get a little bit of a drag line on the, on the right hand side here. But the flash captured the can quite nicely. So exposure separation between the flash and the constant light is very important. Here again, so fast movement. Okay. And then on the turn, the flash went off. So that exposure is quite nice. And then I slowed down the back and forth movement here, which was a mistake. I should have kept that speed up. This one, I'm moving the can from the background towards the camera. So the arc has changed. It's not side to side. It is back to front. Uh, so you can see where the can ends, getting underneath the, the constant light closer to camera. The size has increased. Um, compared to where the flash went off and now we are sort of starting to get the hang of it. so it takes many shots and these are selects you know, there's plenty of shots that i couldn't use um, so again faster movement the can is not crossing its own plane or its own drag line over there so you get a better exposure um, and there's exposure separation between the flash and the constant light this is what happens if you if there's no flash going off so the flash didn't fire on this one uh, can just went across the, the frame and now again you can see the angle of the light so the, obviously the way I'm making the can move um, in relation to the cameras is completely incorrect here the angle of my flash is not right for for lighting up the the can if it's too much from the side it's better if the flash is coming from this direction close to camera and then we can illuminate the front of the can so again not enough exposure separation between the front of the can and the drag line. Uh, we moved the flash a bit and that gave us a slightly better effect. Um, again here, same issues. You can see how nicely the 8300 is, is sort of working on the um, top of the can there. It's obviously much shinier than the front of the can. So therefore you can, there's a much bigger um, flash or exposure separation and You'll notice there isn't a drag line over there because the EV200 is coming from this angle. Just so everybody understands, I've turned all of these so you can just see them bigger on the screen. That's how they were taken. So the EV200 is coming from this angle. Um, it is not putting any light onto the top of the can. That is just coming from the 8300 when it flashes. And it flashes at the same time as the QT600. But the QT is not in the right position either, and therefore there isn't enough exposure separation. Um, okay, so we're back to this, and now we are starting to get into the money. Uh, if we just went over to the layers here, and I ink, let me just, okay, so let's just go over there. And now we can, now we're starting to, to work with magic here. Our, um, 
Red Bull can is looking much better in this shot. And we're almost there. So we try again and we keep going. And always it's important to, so you'll notice here my arc is getting better. And that's because I've now put the can onto a, a boom arm and I'm swinging it on a boom arm. So the arc is constant. It's no longer in my hand like these shots um, that is causing all these little riffles. But I mean, it's, it's a matter of preference. I couldn't do this on a boom arm as effectively. So just to simplify things, I put it on a boom arm to get the replicate the same movement all the time. It's always important to shoot a still frame that is perfectly exposed for post-production later on. So you can take a shot like this and you can just drop this can in there if you have to correct it. So always get that still shot just in case. Uh, in, in this example, now we've added a light painting to the background again. And I, the reason I'm including this, none of these shots were successful. Um, just not enough hands, but I just wanted to show here. So again, back to the layering. When the when the can puts itself down on the sensor through the movement, and the light painting comes afterwards or before, it's already taken up that space if it's before in the on the sensor, and because of its intensity, when it comes after, it will paint over your can uh, position. Here, what happened is the can and the, the the can was moving and at this moment in time the light from the little torch was right behind the can at that very moment so that's why the can is in front of the uh, torch light and as you can see again here so the can goes first then the then the light painting came in so again it puts itself on top same story here there again what happened there is the the torch went behind the can so you can just see in that corner there the can is on top of the torch um, now here what i did was i painted with the light the, the 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 it comes over the can but what i did here was i turned started turning the light away from camera so you so if you start playing with these elements and you put enough time into it you get very interesting effects you can actually have light crossing each other's paths um, with two different elements uh, so you can see there it's in front and there it seems to be behind. So again, the, it's all about the exposure control. The exposure of the green light in this instance, because it's being turned away from the camera, becomes so low that the layering of this drag streak places itself on top, in front, uh, um, on the sensor. Now we started playing with um, an LED strip and you obviously get lovely effects when you start creating or playing with LED strips and this was just absolute luck in this particular instance the, the you can see in over there if I just zoom in on that part um, what would have happened is that the LED would have overshadowed or would have crossed the drag streak and we wouldn't have had such a nice effect much like it's done here so the LED is actually coming over the drag streak um, I'm moving it fairly fast so that's why it's not as intense as the drag streak. But there, because it was all just a sort of on a rope, um, it, it, it went away from the camera. So we got lucky with this exposure here. Um, and again, you just have to keep playing to get nice effects. Now, this is what I mean by whatever comes first. So at this moment, if you look at that silhouette that's being created there, the, the can happened to be at moving at this in this place or in this part of the the sensor at the same time as what the LEDs was crossing that section so at the same moment of time the LEDs and the can were crossing the same part of the sensor therefore the drag streak which was in front of the LEDs the LEDs are constantly behind the can um, they painted over the 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 LED strip so it was causing it was that masking effect causing that silhouette and then the flash fired at that point but again by that stage the can had moved um, faster or slower than the LED strip and therefore the LEDs are now the intensity is stronger than the cans again so now I'm trying you can see now if I if you look carefully over there I've put the LED strip on a on a, on a long ruler and I'm trying to move them at the same time so the same speed across the frame 
the can is on the boom arm and the LED strip is moving behind it. And wherever the can, this part of the can is in front of the, the ruler during the moment of exposure, the can will show up in front. So just keep considering layering when you do this sort of long exposure photography. Um, again, just grabbing a still shot of the can. So the can is stationary in this shot. You can see why the, the way the light is different on it. Uh, no flash was fired in this shot and the LEDs are just moving behind it. And there you can see a beautiful silhouette with the LED behind it. However, the timing is not correct. So if the flash fired at this particular instance, it would have been a great shot, but unfortunately, um, I just didn't get it right. Again, the silhouette over there, the mask, and the can being fired with the flash, and then the drag streak. So my speed has increased quite a lot. Here, you can see that the drag streak is very underexposed, but just to reiterate the difference between exposure in the flash and the drag streak, and then your timing has to be correct to get it all, all right. So there's a shot that we could possibly use. The framing is not um, fantastic. Uh, so if you have assistance that can help with this sort of photography, it works best. Okay, last part, just to quickly run through the stroboscopic flash. I don't think we can have enough time to cover everything, uh, but this is what the stroboscopic flash does. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine flashes happening um, during this. And I am flinging this can quite fast. So you'll see it is a six second exposure, but the can is moving fairly fast during it. The constant light is on, and that is why there is a drag streak in between the cans. Um, but the stroboscopic flash is firing nine times during the exposure. All right, so that's pretty much it. Let me just show you the final shot that we got out of the can. So there's our final shot, uh, just to show you that's the original. Um, the can was very nicely exposed in this. However, that part there crossed the can. And so in Photoshop, I took my still can and I put it in um, and we got a nice shot at the end of the day. Added some smoke in the background. Obviously, you can't get smoke with, uh, with a long exposure like this because it's going to just become a blurry streak. Um, but I'm quite happy with that shot. It's very nice. Change the color in the streak as well, just to match the green on the can. Um, and then we did just played. That's an earlier shot. Just played around a bit um, to get different effects. But this would be the final. Okay, so this is now Michelle's part. I've spoken enough, so <laughs> she's going to have a bit of a chat and explain her thought processes. Um, but this this was the, the shoot that we that we really wanted to do for this webinar. I hope you guys enjoy it. Yeah, just talk. Yeah. Okay, guys, I'm not going to try and explain what goes on in my head because you all need um, counseling after that. So um, basically, I come up with my idea. Uh, we've been watching um, Memos of a Geisha. I'm completely obsessed with J Japan, Japanese culture. Everything about the Japanese is just something that I uh, absolutely I worship. So I came up with Sukechi. I then decided, well, let's make this a little bit interesting and make her a dress out of paper and because remember um and i thought well let me do a sukechi geisha she started as a geisha and then i decided i'd use my daughter as a model um because i thought for the first one it would not be clever for me to do this paper uh, costume on myself and the makeup and and the art direction and everything I thought no let me um rather use my daughter and that simplified a bit and um so that I have control and yeah so I designed it and uh, researched everything I went on to the internet the google as everybody does and uh, pinterest and whatnot and i found the myco and the geisha and made sure that i kept to myco not geisha in the hair in the makeup um all the little details that one will find um and then i made a sculpture so that i could see if this whole idea was going to work so i made the sculpture and i pinned paper to it on a very small scale i hand painted every piece of the now you can see i made the hair um the everything's made out of paper um the, the little danglies for the hair the decorations um and then hand painted 
the I actually made it on iron on violin, <laughs> funny enough, because it's very strong. Um, and I hand painted uh, with watercolors and my Japanese art pens. Yeah, and I had a great time doing it. Look, I, I think I might be over coloring in koi's, having said that I've just started another koi artwork. So I don't know. Yeah, artists are not to be understood. They're just to be accepted the way they are. So yeah, I spent hours and hours deciding on the koi's design and what would be most simple and yet effective. And um, yeah, that's how I came up with Sukechi Maiko. And remember, Maiko is a, a young geisha. It's before she graduates and becomes a geisha, she's known as a Maiko. And he's me painting fishies, lots and lots of fishies here. Yeah. And this is my sculpture. So everything I had to visual to visualize it properly, it had to make sense and also show gear on what's going on in my head, you know, with the ske sketch and, and the sculpture, I think. That yeah, when Michelle says visualize. the dress is going to be made from paper, I didn't quite understand. It right. Time. So initially I, I made a, a wig, but... My wig is very, very old and she started to fall apart. And then I thought, no, wait a minute, my child has dark hair and she was just actually going to lighten it. Now, please don't lighten it yet. Just wait. So, um, yeah, we did the shoot and I managed to think up a way to make those those very uh, tricky geisha hairstyle work. And then we had to now go with the airbrushing. And then, lo and behold, airbrushing is fantastic if your airbrush works. And, of course, as uh, Murphy's Law would have it, airbrush packed up. Yeah, that one that Michelle's using. That too. Sorry. She's using this one. The pot actually fell on the floor and broke. Smashed, yeah. So we lost half the, the makeup. So the Michelle went back to the manual way. Yeah, manual. And, uh, I mean, I've been doing makeup for over 20 years now, so it was actually great to just do it the good old-fashioned way, um, the way my... Um, I've been taught and, uh, yeah, and then put it all together. And, and I had a great amount of fun. I did it on my beautiful child. She's my favorite model. And she's, oh, we had lots of fun. So, yeah. So the, the thing that we wanted to do with Sukechi Maiko is to work with duality. Um, with the shutter drag, you know, because you can put two photographs in one frame um, or in one exposure, rather, we we really wanted to give to give this young girl a choice between you know, uh, going going the, the conventional way or going her own way. Um, so you'll see us play a lot with with duality, two figures in the frame, all these kind of things. Well, sorry, just to, to expand on that, as opposed to her becoming a geisha, just a geisha, we, we kind of said, well, maybe she's going to graduate and become a warrior geisha. Strange things are going on in my head. All right. So I'm just quickly going to explain the lighting setup for the photographers that are interested everybody okay so just a quick walkthrough of the set today right so I'm going to try and point in the right places up here we've got the 80 Godox 8300 with a beauty dish um, and then down here we've got another Godox 8300 inside a P90H parabolic softbox for our practical lights in this set we have this red homemade uh, so I don't know if you can see it there that little beam light over there. Uh, if that could be replaced with like a Godox TL60 or one of those, I think that would work a lot better. And then we've got the FV200 at the back here. So this is our first setup. Um, and we are shooting 70mm Sigma art lens, Sony A7 of 3 body. And we have just sort of set up there you can sort of see that's going to be our background. So what we're doing today is we're playing with um, shutter drag. So our exposure time, we're going to start off with half a second. And then we're going to start building it up. Um, we're going to start today by shooting the close-ups first because the makeup is absolutely phenomenal. So we're going to shoot close-ups first to make sure that we've got perfect makeup. And then we'll jump out to the wider shots and get the big hero shots. Um, so we've got half a second of exposure and... We are closing our f-stop down as we go along because we want to end up with about six seconds um, to give us enough time to move around the set with the practical lights. And we're an ISO 100, f5.6 at the moment, for so the lights are really nice and low. This sort of set up for the clamshell lighting that we've got here. And we're going to just sort of focus on the hair and the makeup to begin with. And then we'll finish up with the big hero shots. Okay, so 
The, I'm going to just show you these ones. These are not shutter drag shots. These are just normal conventional stills. But the Michelle did such an incredible job. I had to just make sure that we got because you know you always forget to to get the you, you sort of go in with one idea and you forget to do the other things. Uh, here we're using the smoke machine. Just a note: I've got mine on a vacuum hose to make it longer. Um, but the smoke can burn. It, it can get hot. So just be aware if you're using a smoke machine so close to your model. And um, everybody's still in great spirits at this point in the day. <laughs> uh, Michelle has been busy with Rory for quite some time with the hair and makeup and, and getting the dress, the final cuts. Yeah. So everybody's still fine. You'll see by the end of this webinar, we're all, we're, we're done. Shattered. <laughs> um, so that was the, the it was straight out of camera shot, that particular setup. Uh, there's the final, just a bit of a change there. And then this one is just to show, don't throw your mistakes away. So here, Rory's busy closing her eyes. And, you know, obviously we thought, oh, that's a wasted shot. Um, and her, eye, uh, her iris is actually a little bit blurry. And then I was playing with it in Photoshop today. And I thought to myself, well, why not make like with AI and everything taking over? Why not make it a little bit weird? And so you, you still have a usable shot at the end. Um, okay, so this is just to show how difficult it was working with this uh, violin dress. Okay, yeah. Well, look, it's it's not altogether that difficult. It's far more forgiving than fabric. You don't have to iron it every five seconds. It's very, you know, it's good. It holds true. But my child is a bit of a worm. So, I mean, at this stage, I was ready to pin it to scale. It's like so irritable. But... Yeah, no, it's it, okay. <laughs> okay, but yeah, we managed to do it and it worked very, very well. So here we are at our second setup for the evening. We've gone over to our shutter drag close up for this. We've got the Godox 8300 in the big silver umbrella. We've got another Godox 8300 in the beauty dish over there. EV200 is our constant light. So we're going to see that flash to fire two seconds after this flash. We will adjust that time. Camera's in the middle. Model is sitting on that chair over there. And that's basically our set. We're going to, during the long exposure, create some effects by moving the background plastic so we can get this lovely red hue spilling all over the, the, the scene. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the setup this far. Let's have a look. So remember what I said in the beginning? You need a dark space for your model to move in. So everything from there changed. There was light spillage from that big umbrella on the right. Um, I had to block off the, the beauty dish on the left. The softbox didn't work for this particular shot. And that white plastic in the background just didn't give us an effect at all. So always be willing to change and, and, and adapt to the, to the shots because they don't always go as you want them to. So here we are. You can see me there now deciding these lights are not working. Let's go back to a hard light and trying to control it with a little bit of foil. And then we should be moving that plastic away pretty soon. Aurora cannot bend her arms or move much. She, the way she's sitting is the way she has to stay at this point. Yeah, we didn't want to add creases to the sleeves yet. Oh, I'm running around in the background there trying to get that light. It almost stopped working as well and had a bit of a shaky connection. So every now and then it just didn't want to switch on. Um, but luckily it held up all the way. I must just also mention in the makeup design, I have a very sad eyebrows. And by this stage of the evening, I think I, thought, I kept on saying, Are you okay? Are you okay? Because it's fine. Okay. We my lights. All right, um, what was I going to talk about? Okay, so final. <laughs> Supporting wife over there. Okay, so just finished the close up shot um, with the shutter drag and learned a couple of things. So there was a lot of light spillage that messed up the shot in the beginning. So here behind me, you can see we've got two lights falling on Aurora. There she is. Okay, so let me just show everybody. That's the setup. So this light spilled onto her white dress. 
That one spilled onto a white dress. How we fix that is we put this little bit of foil. Black foil would have been better, but I can't get black foil here where I live. And then we just put a piece of felt on here to try and keep spillage on the white. Otherwise, that just becomes too much in the shot because of the long exposure. And we changed from the softbox that was giving our constant light through to this sort of snooted foil. Um, and then we made the background completely black. So we took all that plastic away. You can see the beautiful makeup on Aurora. There she is. Michelle's behind the camera for this one. Tyler's on smoke. And I was running around with the red light, the practical one in the background. Uh, you can see the studio is a bit of a disaster. There we go. But it's not a bad shot to start off with. So that's straight out of camera. And we're going to take that into Photoshop and work with it a little bit. So lessons from this one. Uh, this is now before I did the, the product stuff where I figured out this thing about masking. Okay, so here you can see we're moving with a light from screen right to screen left. Rory is moving from screen left to screen right. Okay. In this shot, I was busy crossing her when she was facing forward in the, in the shot. That's why you have... The, the, the silhouette in the front. However, there is no flash in the middle of the shot. So that's why she's silhouetted. Um, so again, painting over our flashed uh, subject with the, with the light. If you change direction, then you get a different effect. And I'm gonna show you those ones in a moment. That was our final shot from this particular setup, which we really liked. Um, so she's on either side of the sword. The little face here on the left is a little bit kinder and softer than the, the harder face on the right-hand side. Um, and I just absolutely love this particular frame. So here's that example. So here I'm, I'm moving behind her from, from screen right to screen left. And, and she is looking screen right and moving screen left as well. So when... When I move past her, the, the face that is looking towards the right of the screen was in front and masked itself onto the, the sensor. And then you can see the, 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 the light cutting her underneath her, her chin um, because that only happened after the light had already painted. So interesting how you can get these effects. Uh, here's a different variant where we started spinning the light behind her and you can see how that slices her, her neck as well. Um, so it's very interesting playing with this idea of both motion blur and um, uh, light painting at the same time, and then obviously using multiple flashes in a single exposure. All right, so the shot that all of this was about. I see we're pretty much out of time, so we, we pretty much said just hold on for a couple of minutes longer. Um, so we into the final shot now. It's a, it's a big landscape shot. We're using the entire studio floor. Uh, just to show you guys, we had to redo this movement a whole bunch of times to get it correct. It was a little bit ambitious, um, but it, it, we've got the, the AV200 constant light top of frame here with a little bit of foil on it. And then we've got the beauty dish and the parabolic softbox on the right-hand side of frame freezing her at the end. So I'm trying to paint a silhouette behind her and then she's supposed to walk. Okay, so it's now eight o'clock. We've been here 12 hours now. It's doing this, um, the shot, but I think we got it. Just to run you through the setup uh, over there, sorry. 
So over there is our 8300 in the parabolic, providing a soft light for our end position. Um, over here is the beauty dish with the 8300. And then again, every 200 giving us a constant light. So starting position is in that corner. Finishing position is right here underneath that uh, beauty dish over there. So the idea is through shutter drag, we create a silhouette with a practical light by spinning it. And then she walks through to the end position. So we get this sort of ghosting effect and we shoot, we freeze her at the end of the frame with a manual um, release of the, of the flash. And that gives us a rather lovely effect. Camera is all the way back there um, because we're on the 70 mil, so we had to create quite a bit of space. And our final shot, let me just show you what it looks like. So there it is, it's our final shot. Um, I'm going to work on this a little bit and make it look even more special. But yeah, that's basically a wrap for today. Um, Michelle was a champion having to pin the dress again and again on Rory. Everything's made out of violin. Aurora was an absolute champion being in the outfit and the makeup all day long. Um, they've escaped, grabbed some pizza. But uh, it's been a great shoot. And I really hope that you guys enjoy this demo and that you learn something from it. I'll explain a little bit more with the voiceovers. Thanks, guys. Cheers. So that's our, our final shot. And that's, um, we, we're very happy with it um, to, to have achieved that in, in one frame. Um, and we learned a lot. We laughed a lot. Um, we also <laughs> almost, we almost, almost stopped doing photography completely. But that's basically it. So just to run through some, some of the shots for this webinar, there's the drag um, done correctly with the, with the right timing. Uh, there's the lucky shot that we got from the product stuff. Uh, Sukechi Maiko version one, um, still from version one. And then here are the finals that we, that we were happy with. So that's it. Wow. Yeah, see me. Wow, Tim Roth, that was really amazing. <laughs> what what do you all think of their work? They are just so creative. They're just incredible, aren't they? I, I personally love seeing the progression of the shots from your thought pros to the exposures. You know, the thoughts that you go through and then the exposures and everything, and then the final images, it's just amazing. And I also yeah, love it. Like, like we like it's a, it's a mess up here, but um, we, we managed to somehow get it all out. So, yeah. Well, I love the advice from Michelle to go with your creative spirit because um, sometimes our logic gets in the way, doesn't it? And the yeah. creative spirit is pushing for more. Mm. You've got to let go and you've got to let God and just go for it. Um, and even sometimes when it looks like a, a pile of rubbish, you, you kind of scratch it together and it, it just comes together. So trust yourself, trust your hands, trust your heart and go. You know? I think that's really great. Uh, and, and I think the big thing is like, you, I mean, you can see there, you know, we're lucky enough to, to do this and work with our daughters and work with each other. But even though we were, we were finished by the end of the day, <laughs> you've got to have fun because it's, yeah. if it's not fun, if you can't find a little bit of humor in the day, um, if it's all just work and being serious, I think you lose the passion somewhere along the line. Um, we, we've got two hilarious kids, so we're very lucky <laughs> with that. Um, but yeah, it keeps the spirits up and keeps you going on. Right now. Yeah, you've got to find the humour, haven't you? You've got to find the humour. So I just think yeah, just, and it, we've got a bit of a delay going on, haven't we? On, Michelle? Nikki, you don't have to be crazy, but it, it certainly helps. Yeah. <laughs> well, for me, the quote of the day was, I think you said, artists are not, are not to be understood, they are to be accepted. And I just thought, wow, we could all do with a bit more of that. You know, less judgment, more acceptance. Perfect. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So are there any more no. questions? Has anyone got a question? Or I think everyone's so shocked with what you've been doing. <laughs> I hope it's in a good way. <laughs> no, no, definitely in a good way. Definitely. 
Definitely. Thanks, Let me see. guys. Such... Just yeah. see if anything comes up. I can't see anything at the minute. Everyone just thinks you're incredible and awesome. Hey, my brother's watching. Hey, brother. Hi, Solomons. Okay, I can't see any questions. So um, thank you both so much. That was a truly inspirational webinar. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Just a quick reminder yeah. to keep a look out for the PICTAS newsletter, which will let you know what's coming up in uh, the future webinars. Um, I'd just like to say enjoy the rest of your weekend, everybody. And until next time, bye from me, bye from PICTAS, and, and bye from this incredible team. Yeah, um, thanks to, to you guys, Nikki, Matteo, Harold, um, for, for the opportunity so that we can share our work with you guys and for, for Pictas being the incredible platform that it is bringing so many people together. And anybody who's not a member of Pictas yet, go over to the website. I really suggest there's a bunch of great people on there and it's, it's a lovely, um, there's a Discord and there's a website and it's just so nice to be able to exchange ideas and have little competitions and and, and share with other creatives. So please like go check them out. This picked us is, is really awesome. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Bo. That was amazing. Right. Okay. Well, that's all from us. See you next time. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Oh, God. Take care. Bye. Be creative. <laughs> yeah, Bye. definitely. <laughs>